So let's kind of shift gears to sort of the diagnostic workup. What do we need to do in these patients? How do we work them up? But we really have to start with the diagnostic challenges. So what's the challenge for you in your clinic in terms of making the diagnosis of IBS? It's a problem for our group because we're all tertiary care. So everybody comes in with a stack of records like this. They've already had everything. So we're not starting with the patient walking in the door the first day. But uh, there is a lot to be said, and, and Brennan can definitely chime in on this, the sooner you make a diagnosis from the time the patient walks in the door on day one to the diagnosis, the more money you save in healthcare, plus patients' quality of life improves likely because they feel like they've been identified. So what's, what's the best approach for the clinician in the community? Yeah, so I think what you said is absolutely right. Making a diagnosis, diagnosis early and confidently uh, convincing yourself and convincing the patient that you have the correct diagnosis is, is essential. Um, and we know that from, from previous studies that patients go under, undergo multiple tests, sometimes unnecessary procedures and even operations uh, to come to the diagnosis of IBS, and so we need to do a better job of getting that diagnosis earlier. I think the, um, the, the concern is obviously the uncertainty that exists among the patient and the, and the doctor, and I think if you follow the criteria and you look for the alarm features that Brennan spoke about earlier, um, and you look at the chronicity of symptoms. Oftentimes patients have had symptoms for quite some time uh, that you can make a very confident diagnosis with just doing limited testing, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I think that the, making that confident diagnosis and convincing the patient and yourself mm -hmm. that you have IBS and doing it early is the most essential thing. Yeah. Can you comment on the health economics of diagno early diagnosis for disease? Sure. I mean, the idea is that, you know, the kind of diagnostic test we're talking about can range from inexpensive, like, you know, a CBC, to quite expensive, like doing CT scans and, and colonoscopies, endoscopies, even sphincter of odium manometries, and it goes on and on and on. So at some point, you got to sort of make the diagnosis and not keep, you know, hanging out this promise that there's another diagnosis that if we just look hard enough and long enough, we're going to find it. And Sometimes that's true. I mean, I don't want to say, like, you know, we, we should stop and be satisfied with the diagnosis of IBS if somebody's not feeling better or the treatments aren't working. But in the absence of alarm features, uh, if somebody, you know, and, and it's particular if they're under the age of, of 45 or 50 for colon cancer screening, then, you know, the use of all of these procedures uh, just adds to, uh, adds to the bill. And, and it also undermines the diagnosis to some degree. And I think that's that's maybe even a more important point because it takes away from uh, this notion that you really do have a condition. Think about something like depression. I, I don't need to do an MRI scan in order to diagnose or the brain to diagnose depression. I mean, psych psychiatrists aren't ruling out 20 other things before they say somebody's depressed. They just say, you meet these criteria and you're depressed. Uh, and they're, 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 they're okay with starting to manage it. So I think we can learn a little bit from that paradigm, but we have to be careful too, not, you know, not to miss things. So maybe we can discuss this a bit. Well, I mean, so the Rome criteria identify the D, the mixed, and the C, and sort of transitioning from this to that. We already talked a little bit about the subcategories, but I, I think what drives some of this disappointment by patients is maybe they were identified as IBS. They don't have the red flags, mm -hmm. but then the treatment doesn't really work. So then in the patient's mind, they say, well, that didn't work, that didn't work, that, maybe the doctor's wrong, maybe it's not IBS, maybe it's something else, maybe I need to do another colonoscopy. So how do we frame out these different subcategories, and, and by subcategorizing, are we doing better in treatment? So can you reflect on that? Well, you know, this really gets to the point that at the current time, the best mechanism that we have to decide on how to work a patient up and how to choose treatment is by their symptoms. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have the degree of precision necessary to really be able to parse patients on the basis of their underlying physiology. So the best that we have right now is symptoms, which is reasonably good, but um, it's certainly not perfect. And uh, you know, I think that we would all agree that there are probably a number of different reasons why somebody might develop abdominal pain and diarrhea or abdominal pain and constipation. Um, the good news is, as all you have pointed out, is that if you meet criterion, the Rome criterion, for example, um, and you have no warning signs or alarm features, we can safely go down a path of minimizing diagnostic tests and choosing therapy. 
but it dooms us to a certain degree to um, response rates of in the range of 40 to 50 percent because of that imprecision. The, the good news is it's not dangerous for it to do it that way, but I can totally understand why it would be frustrating for the patient and the doctor sometimes.